There we go. Oh, I told my readers would be on at six. Is no, it was always 5.30. I am so sorry. My All my information says six o'clock. Well, I don't know why, because I, I talked to I'm so Diane. sorry I'm late. I thought, well, that's okay. a little bit of time. I anyway. just looked up and I, I sent all the links to Lucy and Diane Monday, and they all say Wednesday at 5.30. So there we are. But don't worry about it. It'll, it'll all okay. come out in the wash. And we are live. Um, so good evening, everybody. <laughs> and it will come out in the wash. Hello. <laughs> A little behind the scenes look at, uh, sorry, we're running a little bit late. We just had a kerfuffle with the times. But anyway, we're here and we're very happy to have Richard Paul Evans uh, back with us, albeit virtually, to discuss his new book, The Christmas Promise. And Richard was kind enough to sign a whole batch for us. And uh, I will go ahead and put a, a link to our web store if you'd like to purchase a signed copy. And I'll also be monitoring that. Uh, so if you have questions for Richard, uh, just go ahead and put them in as they occur to you, and I will be summoned back by Barbara towards the end of the hour. So, Barbara, over to you. Thank you. It's so magical. I love being able to do that with Patrick. Um, apologies. We had a slight misunderstanding about the time, so either we're late or we're early. But in any case, since this will live on forever on our Facebook and YouTube pages, um, if you miss part of it, if you come in later, you'll be fine. Um, Anyway, it just happens occasionally. Richard, how lovely to see you. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm delighted to hear that. Um, so The Christmas Promise, I looked it up and this is actually the 15th book in your Christmas list series, but you've also written a couple of other seasonal series, um, Noel and Mistletoe, do I have that right? Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's clear. This is a standalone book, it's not part of a series. Um, I've written 40, this is my 43rd novel. Right. And some of them have Christmas names, some don't. Um, I, I did four books in a row that I called it a collection. They were not connected in any way, uh, the Noel series or collection. And then, and people were starting to get confused. So we just uh, stepped outside. But I write, I've been writing Christmas stories for years. Well, we started out with a Christmas box, which was a phenomenal bestseller. And, you know, your publisher's group, books by authors up in the front of, there's a whole, in fact, it's so impressive, I'll show it to you. There's like two full pages of books written by Richard and um, they grouped them. Um, how did they do it? I thought, you're right, I apologize. I thought the Christmas list was a grouping name, but it's actually the name of a book. In fact, it was the book we talked about last year, if I recall, now that I think about it. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of them. I remember when I first started looking at um, a Danielle Steele book and seeing all those books, and I thought, how is that even possible? And now it's just like, where have the years gone? Because all of a Isn't sudden, everyone was- Isn't you know, This is our 32nd year at the Poison Pen, and I can hardly believe it. I mean, we have authors that, you know, we've been with them their entire career, and I, I still think of Michael Connolly as like age 35, <laughs> and, and he's- you know, zeroing in on 70 and, you know, here we are. It's very, it's really interesting how it works. I think this is a remarkable story and um, there are two things in it that are really fun to explore. One is a writer's group, which for those of you who are inclined in the direction of writing is a lot of fun. Uh, we can talk about that. And the other um, is the nature of the work that uh, Richelle does and that it, you write about that with such understanding and compassion, Richard. What do you know about pediatric intensive care units? Oh, my daughter, my daughter Allison was uh, a PICU nurse, and um, you know I went. She's now is getting a doctorate or, or actually a CRNA in Houston, has is doing a residency. But uh, for about six years, she was a PICU nurse, and that's a rough job. As she said, my patients are always trying to die on me. And um, there are you know, a few times that she literally found mistakes that had been made and saved children's lives. And, but one, one night I was actually on a call, she kept calling me and it's like, you know what? My, when my daughter calls this many times, that becomes a priority. And so I picked it up and I go, honey, are you okay? She was, I, she was crying, she was, I need you. I said, come over, I'll just end what I'm doing. And I went upstairs and I just held her. She goes, I lost two babies today. Oh. And she, I just held her and she just sobbed. And she goes, will it, will it ever get easy? And I said, you know, honey, I hope not. You know, I, I hope that's never easy for you to, to lose life. And you know, she's, she's very compassionate, very loving. And it's just like, it's a tough job. And I, so I have a tremendous about a, amount of respect for nurses 
And when I first started, I have another uh, daughter, I'm really proud of my kids, um, another daughter who is getting her, um, her pharmacology doctorate. And um, I started with that in the book. And that's how I started with the whole drug thing that, that happens um, in the book. And what I soon discovered is you can't really use that because it, they are so self-contained, so encapsulated the way they work. There's just no, there is no way to have interaction because they don't really interact as a, phar as a pharmacist. They don't interact internally with people. So the drama became impossible. So that's why I switched it to the PICU nurse. Uh huh. Well, you know, there's a, a phrase that you use that I thought was really terrifying and at the same time, very, um, very expressive, which is, and I'm trying to remember whether you said that what they do is they withhold care or, wait, or they withdraw care. But basically what it means oh, yeah. is that they've done all they can for the child and then they let the child die. Um, and oftentimes the parents are there alongside. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know how anybody can do that um, as a, on a regular basis. It must be, maybe, maybe you overcome it by having done your very best you could to sustain life. And when it becomes impossible to do that, you just have to accept it. Yeah, that's what it is. Uh, withdraw care is when there's nothing else we can do. We've done everything that, that's possible. And in fact, there are times when it almost becomes cruel to not. Yeah. But nature take its course. Well, yeah, I, so think that, I think anyway, that's anyway. That's my main character for those listening. My main, uh, the main character. That's her job. She works as a PICU nurse um, at a hospital, and so um, that adds a little backdrop to who she is. It is a backdrop, but it's important to understand that that is her work because her her personal life um, is well. It's your story, so you can tell it. But there was something I wanted to point out on page five for one thing i'd like to say before i even talk about the story this is a really beautiful book it's lovely internally it has um artwork it has chapter headings that are nice and richard has included in every chapter a um, an extract from richelle box diary which i think um is very illuminating of her character and her situation and the one I love is on page five. My father once described hope as, quote, the consolation of a weary traveler when the destination is still out of sight. At this point in my life, hope, I suppose, is the reason I get out of bed in the morning. So the fact that she is a pediatric intensive care nurse, I think this relates to it. Well, that's part of it. But her personal life is awful. You know, she's just lost her father um, and her sister. She's an identical twin. And um, this is something that was intriguing to me. I, we have, my wife has a cousin she's very close to and they're identical twins. Um, these um, really handsome Italian men. She just called them my beautiful cousins. And one of the twins died a few years ago. And um, we have stayed very close to the survivor and the amount of guilt he feels for surviving is really tremendous. It's, um, they call themselves twinless twins and we've gone through that in many ways with them. The amount of pain he feels is, it's just stunning to me. Twins have a bond and a connection that they, you know, they came in together. There's this assumption as one told me that we're gonna go out together and we don't, you never go out together. And so um, just watching his pain, he's really suffered and I thought, this would add, add a really interesting um, dimension to the story, especially in their case, where these two sisters look completely identical. They look, no one can tell them apart. Um, however, personality-wise, so you get to know them, personality-wise, they couldn't be more different. And so um, that adds to the whole, the whole conflict of, of, of building the story. I love the opals. We'll get to talk about the opals in a few minutes. But, but what I wanted to say is having her having read that or written that and you putting it in the story, she says, this story is true. And in sharing it with you, I've included a few of the diary entries I wrote at that time in my life. But this is the paragraph I really love, Richard. Knowing how a story ends may take away our fear, but in so doing, it must equally take away our hope. And to tell this story without hope would rob it not only of its truth, but also of its deepest meaning. And, you know, the power of stories is so tremendous. I think it's something that we've all um, 
found particularly important in our lives over the last couple of years when a lot of the meaningless interactions or daily interactions that, you know, that we used to pass the time we couldn't do. And so we've, many people have dived into stories, whether on long form television or in books or whatever. And maybe, you know, the power of storytelling has been particularly visible and particularly powerful over the last two years. I, I think, I, I think so. I think in some ways being kept inside more than usual, we've seen like um, Netflix has grown tremendously during this time. And um, the pre-orders on my book on this one are almost triple over last year. They're huge. And uh, I'm not really sure why. I think, I think people are excited to read it. There's been great reviews. But I also think that people are introspective right now. And I tend to write very introspective books. Indeed, you do. Um, there's a lot of interesting information in Richard's books that um, I love reading for things I learn. Um, and while the emotional power of the story is great, there are all kinds of interesting bits as you move along. But we're, look, Rochelle, well, tell us about Rochelle. Why don't you set up her situation and her character? And then maybe we could talk about her writer's group because I think you did that so well. Well, R Rochelle, the, the, the story of the Christmas promise is really the story. Of, um, of the prodigal son, but it's said in this case, it's the prodigal daughter. And Rochelle is really the older brother in the Bible story. So it really is, it really is a, bi a biblical analogy, even though you may not ever see that or, or feel it as you read. And so um, you saw it. Absolutely. Good. And, and so in fact, could I just say before you go on that I love the fact that you actually define the word prodigal because it's often misunderstood. Yeah, people assume prodigal means wayward. It doesn't. It means extravagant. And um, so this is this is her story that she she has always looked down in some ways on her sister, and then her sister does something that just um, breaks the relationship forever. And I'm not <clears throat> I'm not giving a spoiler because I say that in the first chapter. Mm -hmm. You know, it sets up. She hasn't talked to her sister for years. She'll never forgive her sister. And then her sister dies. She never gets a chance. And this is really about about discovering, discovering um, what is good, you know, what is really real and right. And- well, Don't um, you think it's also about absolving guilt because she makes a deathbed promise to her father, Rochelle does. Yeah. Um, he asks her to forgive her sister. And even there, she really doesn't want to, she does tell her father that, that she will, and then her sister is killed and she doesn't get a chance to do it. Yeah, we always assume that we have, we have someday, right? Someday is going to happen, but uh, we don't always have time. You know, some things we shouldn't procrastinate. And in this case, um, the father is very much like the father in the biblical story, the prodigal son, where, um, you know, he, when he goes to the older brother, says, come to the party and celebrate. And he's like, no, no, I, I'm the good one. Remember, I'm the good one. I did everything right. And that's where Rochelle is in some way is saying throughout the whole book. I'm the good one here. I'm the victim. I'm the one who did everything right. I obeyed the rules. And um, it's, a, it's a chance to really challenge those thoughts because in the end, it's like, am I really as good as I think I am? And there are some, I, this is a book that I think has some really powerful twists. I think it has some, it has some lines that took my breath away. Uh, my agent gasped at part of it. And um, I, you know, I, I, think, I think it makes for a fun read for that reason, which is my primary goal. I mean, I don't write books to preach, I write books to entertain and hopefully inspire Do people, you know, consider their situation, who they are. Absolutely true. I read it all in one gulp because I'm fortunately a really fast reader, but um, I was really gripped by the story. And, you know, it just as Rochelle wonders about JT, this man that comes into her life, um, who he really is and why he's there, so did I. Um, and it was really interesting, you know, to, to move along. Uh, we can't do any spoilers here because, I mean, it's not a crime novel, but nonetheless, why, why would we spoil any of the twists? But um, I, was, I was really racing towards the end in one sense. And in another sense, I really wanted to savor much of what was going on in the book. And I, I like that push-pull as a reader where you really want to turn the pages and find out how the story goes. But at the same time, you want to really enjoy um, both the author's prose and the and the underlying themes of the book. 
Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad. I'm, I, because, I mean, I have Tourette syndrome and attention deficit, which makes it difficult as a writer, but it also has sharpened my writing. If, it's, if something slows down at all, I just throw it out. And those diary entries many times are actually the prose that I threw out because it slowed down the book, but I thought it was beautiful. I liked it. So the, the diary entries are actually, um, they're, they're kind of a trademark of mine. They've been in my book since my second book, Timepiece, you know, 40 books ago. And so I've, I've used those for years as a, a device and they became my readers' favorites. They like it so much. I did, when I first wrote this book, I didn't put diary entries in it and the book didn't feel right. And then it just hit me. It's like, you know what? We're missing so much texture to this book. And so I went back and wrote the 40 some odd diary entries and it totally changed the book. It changed the feel, the emotion. And um, I'm very glad I did. I think it saved the book actually. I think it made it powerful by doing that. Well, what happens is that, you know, because mostly what we see we, or our time with Rochelle as we're moving through the book, she's in conversation with people. Um, but in the diary entries, you know, it's all internal. Um, we're, we're inside her, her mind and it's a different point of view than it is, you know, when she's talking to the other customers. I mean, the other characters. I like the yeah, way it makes, too. And it makes presented. her more likable too. Yeah. Hmm? Oh yeah. Yeah, it, right. it, but it I mean, I like the fact that they're in red and they're at the top of the chapter and, um, you know, they get your attention and they do interrupt the flow for just a minute, but on the other hand, they accelerate your understanding of Rochelle and the way the story is going to go. So they, it's, a, it's a really interesting dynamic and I, I can see it wouldn't be the same book without them. No, absolutely. Yeah. When, I, when I first did it, I mean, I wrote my first book, I was 29 years old. I'd never studied writing. I wasn't a big reader and I write the Christmas box and becomes this massive number one international bestseller. And so I'm writing the second book. I'm thinking, well, it's going to be a third person. I didn't know how to do that. And um, I just, I, I was self-taught, right? I just had to start doing it. And then as I'm writing, I'm thinking, well, there's so many things I want to get in her head. I can't get in her head. And, I, and that's when I started writing these diary entries. And I soon found that people loved them. And so I'm going on book tour and people are saying, that's my favorite part of the book. And in one place, a woman said, you know, do you have David Parkin's diary? And I said, well, no, David Parkin doesn't have a diary. He's not a real person. And, and she goes, no, no, the one you took the extracts from, that diary. And I said, well, no. I said that, again, though I wrote those. She goes, you wrote those diary entries, not David Parkin? I said, again, David Parkin's a fictional character. And she goes, well, no, I think David Parkin's a better writer than you are. <laughs> and so I was like, okay. It's, it's a different kind of writing, but it, it worked really well and people loved it so much. I've carried that over in almost all of my books, at least, you know, at least more than 30 of them. Well, it works extremely well. And I'm turning to page 44, which is, well, Thursday, November 14th, because the ticking clock in this book is we're moving towards Thanksgiving, right? Mm -hmm. And then Christmas, but I mean, they're two, both holidays. There's a, a story arc that is going to um, arrive at Thanksgiving, and so we're in November, and then eventually we arrive, as it would say, at Christmas. But um, I, I really love this part of the diary entry. Tonight, our writer's discussion was on how long a book should be, which is a question I've actually discussed with many authors. Not only how long should a book be, but how do you know? how long a book should be when you're writing it. She goes on to say, I don't think anyone could give better advice on this matter than Lewis Carroll. Quote, begin at the beginning and go on until you come to the end and then stop. I, mean, I love that, you know, but, but then of course there are the questions, where's the beginning? Because oftentimes, you know, I've, I've seen so many manuscripts in over my career, oftentimes the beginning of the book that's published is not the beginning that the author started out with. You know, you have to start somewhere, but sometimes the somewhere is not really where the book ought to start, but you tell yourself the story and then you find out where it began and then you go on and then you get to the end. Um, and do you think, Richard, that, that you, you know, you as a writer and, and most writers after you, especially after you publish more than one book, you have a kind of unconscious feeling for how long the story should be. 
because some writers write really long and some writers, you know, write shorter. Um, do you think it's it's a a rhythm that the that you set for yourself and then you unconsciously meet it when you write? Maybe. Uh, um, yeah, rhythm is right. I, I mean, my first book, The Christmas Box, was only 16,000 words. And I remember I'm, I'm with um, Brian Lamb on C-SPAN. And, and Brian said, well, he, and I had the letter. And the letter was about 75,000 words. He goes, how many, how many copies of this are in print? I said, well, they did about 750,000 copies. He goes, how many copies of this book? He picked up The Christmas Box are in print. And I said, there's about 3 million copies right now. And he goes, so you've sold 3 million copies of this, this little one. He goes, you need to write shorter books. <laughs> well, that, there's a lot of wisdom to that. And, and I just remember saying, well, the, every book has its own length. And yeah. so um, the one thing that about my writing is I, I, I keep things as austere as possible in some ways. I, um, the, again, the book has to move quickly. I get bored so, so fast and I have to read the book 70 times. And so if anything starts slowing down, I just, I just cut it. And sometimes it's kind of heartbreaking. But so when my readers pick up a book, I hear it all the time, especially with my young adult Michael Bay series, it's the only book my child has ever read. I hear that every single day and half for the last 11 years. And that's why I sold three and a half million copies. It's still, it, it's, it's like, you got my boy to read. And I said, well, I was actually in the slowest reading group in school. Reading was really hard for me. And so that came around to become a blessing because when I write my books, they have to move fast. They have to be interesting all the time. And then also, if you look at like some of us, so like James Patterson and myself, we were former ad guys. We wrote 30 second and 60 second radio commercials. You'll notice we have a lot of chapters that are very short. Okay? That's, how, that's how we think, all right? That's how, that's how we were trained in writing, that everything has to catch your attention. Everything has to move quickly. And so we compartmentalize these little chapters going through. And that, that's why I write the way I write. And if you compare that, I saw you had my friend David Baldacci on. He's a lawyer. And him and John Grisham and Scott Turow, they write like lawyers. Okay, they, they, they're, um, they fill things out more. They just have longer chapters. It's just, it's a different, it's a different feel. And, and it really is about who we are. I think so. I mean, you know, storytelling is a uniquely personal thing for every writer. Um, and one of the thing, advantages to these being relatively short books is this lovely package. It, you know, it's a, it's a book you can hold, you can almost cuddle it, you can put it under your pillow. Um, you know, you can envision it as a Christmas gift, the artwork tells you all that. So if this were, you know, a big book, it wouldn't have the same impact. It was, well, and the deckled edges and uh, I mean, it looks, it's foil, right? it looks like it's wrapped mm -hmm. and so because it looks like a gift. And that, I mean, my very first book, people, I mean, I, I had someone come to book signing and buy more than 80 copies just for his family. And even this one, I have someone who's coming by to buy the emails and buying 36 copies. Um, they look like gifts and people share them as gifts. They feel good about, they want people to have the same experience they do. And so it's all part of the package. You know, you pick up Harry Potter, you know what it looks like. You know it's gonna, what it's gonna feel like. So, and you know, the books are about, you know, 65,000, 70,000 words, which is, which is about medium length. I mean, it's sh shorter than many and, and um, longer than some, so. But it's perfect. It's perfect for what it is. It's perfect for the package and it's perfect for the story. You know, this reminds me, before we go any further, I should say that we do have autographed copies of the book in the store, but the actual on sale date is now next Tuesday. So um, we're, we're fortunate that we're able to talk to Richard ahead of publication date and we can't actually give you this book at the poison pen over the counter until next Tuesday or we'll get wrapped on the knuckles the publisher. So we want to be careful. Um, that's been a, a tale all fall that for various reasons, production times have had to change and, um, and books have moved their dates and it's confusing for readers, but that's the way it works. So um, back, to, back to Rochelle um, and her twin's name is Michelle. So Rochelle, Michelle. And Michelle. Michelle and Michelle. Right. And um, what's, their, what's their ethnicity? Because that's part of the story. Yeah, they're, they're Asian, um, they're, they're half Taiwanese. So her father, who was in the military, 
um, was in, stationed in Taiwan. I lived in Taiwan um, and I was stationed in Taiwan and married a Taiwanese woman. And then she gives birth to twins, comes back to America and decides she doesn't want to be a mother. So she leaves the little girls. Uh, this is, I have a Chinese daughter and uh, we adopted from Guangzhou. And it was interesting because she, we picked her up the same time my wife gave birth to our son. So it was kind of like having twins, but people would ask if they're twins and it's like, she's Asian. It's like, think, think, think. it's like, how, how can they be twins? And, um, but it was funny when I was, I remember when I was over living over there, I remember someone said to me, it's like, well, yeah, you Americans all look alike. And I thought, oh, well, Americans say that about Asians and um, realize that there's no psychological st studies that show that, um, that when we look at other races that we actually don't distinguish as well as our, as our own race. It's just psychological. And they certainly are that way about us and about other races. And so um, if you have identical twins and they're Asian, Americans would never be able to tell them apart. You know, just, they, just, they just wouldn't. Um, and so that's what they are, which makes it even more complex in their case. It does. Um, because, you know, because you have someone who's like, calls herself the good one, you know, I'm the good one. And the one who calls herself the evil twin. Well, the evil twin, people come up and tell how wonderful she is and how much they loved her talk at graduation. And she's like, that was my sister. I barely graduated. You know, it just kind of rubs in the fact that she's not her. Um, and, you know, Rochelle kind of feels the same way that she's not as fun as her sister. She kind of feels that too. So there's this tension between uh, these, uh, these two women. I think it, because the fact that they look identical makes it more interesting. It does make it more interesting. But because their mother, you know, left them, they are, um, that's a trauma for children. Um, and that definitely shapes their personalities, but it also makes them very close to their father. And as you read this book, you really, really admire He's unfortunately died. Um, so we only know him through what Rochelle tells us about him. Um, but I mean, he clearly was a marvelous parent. Um, did you model that on yourself? Yeah, I adore my daughters. I, I mean, I'm not saying I'm a remarkable parent, but my kids like me. And I think that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> my kids, um, like I said, my daughter called to dad, I need you. And I went and just held her. It's like, um, they like me. I, I adore them. And um, I think that's my best endorsement. They, they want to be with me. They, you know, they'll invite me to their parties. Like, hey, I'm 50. I don't, <laughs> I'm in my 50s. It's like, you don't want me to parties. No, you're fun. And, um, and they also talk to me about the serious things, you know. Um, so I, I, I thought it was, I wanted to show that. I wanted to show this really strong um, father figure, but also dealing with McKenna where she was orphaned as a child. We took her back to Guangzhou uh, to see where she's from. If, there's actually a Netflix documentary called Found. And my wife was watching that and she, she calls me, she goes, come up and look at this. And she goes, do we know her? And I go, oh, yes, I do know her. That's who handed me McKenna. That, that's the woman I, that, who gave, me, gave us our daughter. And it was, I said, you've been in that orphanage. And I pulled up the pictures and showed her. It's like, no, we know her. And so they actually did a documentary on the woman who gave us our child. But taking McKenna back to see this little, it was, they, it was a rubber a rubber tree um, mm -hmm. village, maybe three or 400 people. I said, McKenna, you would know everyone here. And they, they spoke a very kind of um, low level of Cantonese. And, um, you know, they're just country people, barefoot. And, and it's like, you would have been raised here. And she just cried. It was just, it was an amazing experience, but she has had to deal with that. It's like, where's my mom? And even at a young age, she said to me when she was, um, we always thought someday we'll have a talk with her about where she's from and, and um, that the cultural challenges why, why Chinese parents would give up a child. It's not that they didn't love their child. It's like there are cultural things that made it almost impossible to have an extra child. And so um, one day she's, she was literally five years old. She goes, mom, you, you said I, I, I came from China, but countries, she's five, countries don't have babies. Babies come from mommy's tummies. Whose tummy did I come from? And it's like, well, I guess we're gonna have that conversation a lot sooner than we thought we were going to have. And you can see that in McKenna. I mean, even as older, she, she is such a, a beautiful young woman. And, but 
like I called her, I said, hey, hey, McKenna, if you can get off, um, see if you can get off, I'm giving you enough time. We're, we're taking the family to Disney World. We're all going. And she goes, oh, can I come? It's like, can you come? Why would you ask that? Of course you would know everyone but you. It's like, why, why would you ask that? And they realize that deep inside of her core, there is that strong feeling of abandonment. And so um, I wanted to address that, but I also wanted to give her a really loving father too as well, because Rochelle was abandoned as well. And that always brings issues because at some level, the child's always saying, what did I do wrong? How did they leave me? And it has nothing to do with them. They just, they just are. And um, every child is beautiful and worthy of, of tremendous love. And so there's a lot of issues I brought into this, but you know, so many from my you know, personal life. Well, if the father wasn't such a remarkable father and, and Rochelle wasn't so close to him and so admiring of him, the fact that she hasn't fulfilled this promise to him makes it much harder for her. You know, she, she can't just disregard it. But as you say, because, you know, when there's something we don't particularly want to do, we think, you know, well, someday I'll get around to it. And then some days taken away from her. You even write that, you know, when her sister is killed in the car accident, that, um, that she feels a pain in the, you know, in her body, the same as, as her sister probably felt. Yeah, you know, I, and I'm curious about this because they say it's not possible. But I remember talking to my sister-in-law, who's an identical twin, and I could never tell her apart from her twin. They, they were completely identical. And she said her sister was hit by a car. That's where I got that. She was, she was hit by a car and I knew it. I suddenly had a stomach ache and doubled over. And I told my, my, my parents, there's something wrong. Something's wrong with Jolie. There's Jolie and Julie. Just, something's wrong with Jolie. Something happened. And, and that happened. And you can explain, explain it away, but it's just, it happened. And um, so there, I think there is a connection that twins have, a psychological and maybe a spiritual bond that's just, that we don't completely understand. But at the same time, Rochelle points out that while, you know, there are instances of twins who are separated at birth, but then, you know, as they grow, they have the same taste or, you know, they, the same allergies or whatever it might be, that she and her sister were so different in their personalities and their inclinations and even their abilities. And she ends up taking a, a math test for her sister. Uh, because yeah. her sister's going to flunk out of, I mean, not going to graduate and, um, and guilts Rochelle, who's very good at math and so forth, into standing in for her or sitting the exam for her. I love the fact that, you, you know, because Rochelle's saying, well, how are we going to get away with that? And Michelle says, well, we could just dress the same when we go to school that day. And then, you know, nobody will be able to tell that it's you. Yeah. But at the same time, if they're that different, I suspect that at least a lot of their friends actually knew about this bait and switch thing and they just didn't rat on them. Yeah, I, well, and Michelle's friends would all be wild too. So, um, but she tells her a couple of things. First of all, you can't get all the answers right because she would never get all the answers right. So she, it kills her that she actually has to answer things wrong. Yeah. And it's like, because she's just a perfectionist. So uh, the other thing, she has to chew gum, which she doesn't do because her sister chews gum. So she has to like change her posture. She has to just, she has to kind of dumb down a little bit to get away with it. And her teacher then grabs her. She thinks I've been caught or her sister's teacher. And he goes, if you had shown this kind of dedication, you could have done so well. It's you like, could be yeah. like your sister. In fact, I think. Yeah. Is he says, you could be like your sister. He's like, yeah, I could. Right. Exactly. <laughs> So tell us about the opals because the father um, gives them um, each a particularly spectacular present. Yeah, I have, um, I love opals. I've always been fascinated by opals. It's my birthstone. And I just, there's so many, there's so much um, kind of mystery surrounding opals, right? There's so much lore and myth. And, um, and I thought this would be an interesting way to create a metaphor of these two girls because he gives them both an opal and the same carrot that they look the same from the outside. They're black opals. So looking from a distance, they look identical, but no opal is the same. None of them, they're never, because they're, they're so unique, the fire inside. And so it's a great metaphor. He said, look, both of these stones are valuable, just like you, they're different. 
Okay, your fire is green, her fire is orange. It's like, it's different, but they're both beautiful and they're both valuable. Everything his father does. I mean, even the, the promise he asks her to make isn't about him. Oh. It's, never, it's not about him. He, he's doing it for her. He's, he's trying to help her see. And uh, the opals are the same thing. He's constantly trying to see, he knows his daughters. And he's, he is saddened that, that the one who is doing so well doesn't recognize that her sister is also a good person. And, but she, maybe she can't perform like she does. Maybe she doesn't have the discipline, but she's suffering from that. She hurts from that inside. And the father sees that and he knows that and he loves his daughter. So he's constantly trying to bring them together and realizes that it's really the good daughter who's the weak link here. She's the one that's keeping away and she thinks she's doing it because she's doing the right thing and she's the rule keeper and her sister's wayward. When it's like, no, love is love. And um, I think that's a very timely lesson for today that we, we just see in the world, we have so many things to divide us. And, um, you know, that's not what we need. We don't need more division. We need more, we, we need more connection. We need more forgiveness. We need more love. So we have Rochelle who um, is not, is alienated from her sister. And, you know, I can't really blame her without discussing why, um, for why yeah. she, at least the rift developed. And her father is dead and her mother deserted her. And she works in the pediatric care unit, um, intensive care unit. So, you know, there's, um, and she's, she's quite solitary. So the thing, one of the things that she does that helps sustain her is she's thinking about maybe she'll write a book. Um, and so she belongs to a writer's group. Um, and the interactions in the writer's group, I think are absolutely wonderful. Have you ever joined one yourself? <laughs> I, don't, I can't see you in a writer's uh, group, so I'm curious. No, no, yeah, no, I've never belonged to a writer's group, but I've gone to a lot of them. And I coach a lot of authors. In fact, I have an author coaching program called Author Ready. And right now I'm coaching about 300 authors. And um, it's, it's funny to see them because, I mean, we, we had an event last Saturday and it's like, they cannot be more different. You know, so at one level is, is gals writing these scary paranormal stories. And next to her is one writing about genealogy. And the other, one, the other side is very religious. And then we had a pro skier, extreme skier. And, uh, it's like the personalities were so different. And that's what that's one of the great things about being an author. And one of the great things is, you know, seeing that. I remember going to the American booksellers uh, back when it was called the ABA and being in uh, uh, Los Angeles. And I remember sitting there at my booth and having a guy. I mean, here I am, this kind of white bread kid. And, you know, this gal came by and her book was called From Beverly Hill Cops to, to Call Girl. She was a call girl. She came and sat down and talked to me and the guy with I, he looked like Bob Marley, you know, had the, um, had the dreadlocks. And he came and sat with me. And we're sitting around just having a great time talking about books and being an author. And it's like, we, this would happen in no other possible realm. And so when I put that in the story, it makes it, I thought it made it really fun. Every one of those characters I write in the writing group, I mean, the, the fights they have are kind of hilarious, but they're all based on real people. They're, they're all true people I've seen. And, and, um, you know, I, I would start out by using the real name of them just to keep them in character and then, of course, change it before it got published because the last thing I want them to do is see themselves in it because no one wants to see um, just how weird we all are <laughs> and how funny it's, it's out sometimes. Uh, but it, it was fun writing that part and interjecting her in that. And it gave, it gave a way for her to meet JT and to create a love story because at the core, at the core it really is a love story. It is a love story. I mean, well, it's actually more than one love story, but yes, it is. It's a very powerful love story. Did you decide, um, I mean, because when we see Rochelle at the writer's group, she's actually the leader of the, um, they don't have a, a president or anything, but they take turns they take leading turns. the group. And the person leading the group um, proposes uh, a discussion topic. So, do, you know, are those, how did you come up with those? Because they're really a lot of fun. Well, there's a, well, like one of the uh, one I started off with is probably the most preachy I get is I'm seeing something that scares me a little bit in the publishing world. I'm seeing, I'm seeing internal censorship. Yeah. That if someone doesn't want to hear something that they don't believe in, they call it hate speech. 
And I'm seeing this, uh, my daughter told she couldn't write something because she couldn't possibly understand because she's not blind. She was talking about a girl losing her sight. Well, you, that's insensitive of you to write that. And um, I take great um, issue with that. Um, we All writers have to be able to channel other people. I've never murdered anyone in my books. I've probably murdered 30 people, right? It's like, we, we're never our characters, but the ability to capture that and um, to actually go in and, and get to understand people better in writing. In my Michael Bay series, I wrote a, about a, child, a, a young woman with autism. And um, I heard from so many autistic parents. I have a grandson who has autism and heard from so many parents who were so grateful that I brought this child out, that I was able to talk about her and who she is. And, and so when I talk about, is anything off limits? I, re I really believe in what we used to say, and that is I, I may disagree with what you have to say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. That was something that my character said. That is something we used to believe. And, and people say, well, well, we're gonna be more sensitive. It's like, you don't get it. You, this is censorship. This is, you, you're not looking at this correctly. You're not, you're not being honest about this. You've created a way to create censorship. And I've, and I've never seen it in my 25 plus 30 years of writing. I've never seen it until now. And it terrifies me. So they have a discussion, what's off limits? And you know, the Supreme Court decided that years ago. And, and I, I think it's, a, I, if anything, at least it'd be thought provoking and look at it. to say, look, you can say things I don't agree with. And now, especially with social media, that happens all the time. And, but the thing is we've changed so much I and mean, we don't have, uh, the press doesn't even pretend to be um, objective anymore. Everything is designer. We have designer news. If I wanna watch something that's, that's pro-Biden, I watch this channel. I watch something that's anti-Biden, I watch this channel. It's designer news. We hear whatever, we're, we don't wanna hear truth anymore. We wanna hear confirmation. Yeah. And um, to me, it's terrifying. And it's, the, but it's the reality. So sometimes these books give me, give me a platform to talk to hundreds of thousands of people about something. I just want just like, just think about it. Just think about these issues. And could you imagine if someone walked through your bookstore? Um, and I've had two books banned of mine. And so I know, I know what it's like, and it's, it's an interesting experience to have books banned and all for different reasons. And it's, 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 it's kind of crazy. I mean, it's like, if you can ban my book, you can ban anyone's book, right? Because people say, how in the world did you get banned? But on the other hand, um, I had the most wonderful readers when my book, The Last Promise was banned by a, by a, um, a huge national chain. Um, they, four of my readers were taken out of bookstores by police protesting. And, um, you know, thousands of them would, would attack the media. And it's like, I have the best fans on the planet. They are so loyal and I just adore them, which makes me work all the harder to give them the best book I can give them. But that's why I'm still around after 30 years and still hit bestseller lists um, again and again, because I, I give my best to these wonderful people who make it all possible for me. Well, you're certainly right that you know, this cultural appropriation thing, the whole bit, actually yesterday, because we did several conversations, David Baldacci, who already mentioned, one of the questions I asked him was, you know, um, what kind of reaction did he have when he, I mean, because his current book, Mercy, um, is about women. You know, the main character is a woman. Um, there's, and, you know, has he had negative feedback because he, a man, is daring to write about women characters? And, um, you know, I think about Tony Hillerman. We did an event for his biographer. And Tony today, I think, would have an extremely difficult time getting his first book published because he's not, you know, not who he's writing about. And I really just like that. I think it's absolutely censorship. I think that people who write, you know, um, there's a different standard for nonfiction, but, you know, all point of fiction is to make things up, but you make them up in a way. Fiction is actually, it's harder to make up something that feels real than it is to write about something that is real. I mean, there's a higher standard for fiction, don't you think, um, feeling yeah, real than, than nonfiction? Yeah, I think she even says in the book, it's much, it's, it, fiction is, um, nonfiction is stranger than fiction. I mean, I've, I've taken true stories and had to tone them down so they would fit in the fiction because nonfiction can be anything. If, if it happened, it happened. But fiction has to appear real. Mm -hmm. 
And so it has to be convincing. It really does. Yeah, you it, know? It, it's like, well, that would never happen. It's like, well, guess what? Really bizarre things do happen in this world and strange coincidences and synchronicity and all that. It does happen in this world. But as a fiction writer, we have to avoid that. And that's not censorship. That's just a matter of credibility. It's like, I want to write something that you pick it up and you say, yeah, this probably happened. And, you know, my very first book, The Christmas Box, was written as if it happened. And I was, man, I was only uh, 29 years old at the time. And I looked like I was 20. Um, and I would go to these bookstores. I'd go to like media and I would sit there and people would ask me when the author was going to get there. They assumed the author was an old man. They always did. And I just, I would sit there. It's like, well, that's me. It's like, no, this couldn't possibly be you. Because it was written as from an old man's perspective. Um, and, so, and, and, and so when I write these stories, it says this story is true. Well, it's, it's, it's not true um, literally, but metaphorically it is. I think, I think the hallmark of a successful writer of fiction is that, that the book is convincing. It's a story that, you know, maybe you created it, but the truths in it are, are powerful and people can see themselves um, or incidents in their lives very often um, illuminated in ways. I think biography oftentimes um, is more truthful about a person's life than autobiography. Because an autobiography is written through the filter, you know, of the person, his memories, um, whatever. Whereas a biographer has a wider range um, to look at. And historical fiction oftentimes, I think, takes us to truths um, about what happened in a particular time that nonfiction might not be able to do. I no, I absolutely agree. And I would take it one step a step further and say that. Um, fiction for that reason is more true because when someone writes a biography, let's say I write a biography about um, Hitler. I, I, I don't like the guy right? it's like to write about. It. So I'm going to be biased in what I write as well. Where fiction, uh, so everything's based on a, an agenda, but fiction tends to be um, a, a natural outspring, a birthing from the reality. And so I think fiction tends to be more true. I think you can tell more about a, a culture and society by reading their fiction books than their nonfiction. So I haven't talked about all these deep things. There's some really fun stuff in this book. So I am going to go back to page 55 and page 56 when we are talking about, um, it starts out, there's an eggnog thing going on in this book. And so she, um, she in the process of ordering eggnog, there's a reply that says, well, we're a special breed, we noggers. I think you just made that work up. I'm absolutely sure that I did. Did you know there's such a thing as phobia of eggnog? It's called nogophobia, right? I think you made that up too. No, it's real. But then we go on. So, you know, I love the fact, the fear of clowns. Now that one I knew, but I really like nomophobia. Did you make up nomophobia or is no, it an actual no, word? It's real. It's a real word, yeah. So and I was looking at phobias. And it, I mean, actually, that's that's the. It sounds like uh, FOMO, fear of missing out, but nomophobia. Um, it's the fear of being without your smartphone. Um, and I think we've all <laughs> experienced that. It's kind of terrifying. It's like, where's my phone? Um, but it's 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 funny how things like these little conversations things come out. I love eggnog. Okay, it's like, it's, I'm diabetic. I, it's like, I shouldn't drink it. It's like, but it's like this time of the year, I love it. Well, last year I had COVID and it changed my taste and I drank eggnog and I spit it out. I didn't like it. It's like, I really loved eggnog. <laughs> I wanted to like eggnog. Please don't let this be gone. So I, I waited a year. I tried some, and it was okay last week, but I used to love the season for eggnog. So I just make these little nods to things in my life that, I think that's what make make the books feel real, and I think make them interesting. Just pulling these little tidbits from places. Well, I really like noggers. My husband's a nogger, so you know I'm going to hit him okay. with noggers. But I didn't know about nomophobia. But you know, I'm not even a, a, a particular social. I mean, I don't do any personal social media. I do do a little bit for the bookstore, and yet there is a real anxiety now when you leave the house if you you check to see if you have your phone. Because people's expectation is now that they can always reach you, whether it's your business, whether it's your family, um, 
I often wonder why criminals haven't figured out that the, you know, they need to leave their phones at home and experience nobophobia because otherwise law enforcement can track them. But it's just become like, you know, almost stapled to us. But I also like another word that you come up with, neophobia. And that one I hadn't really thought about either. So what's the definition of neophobia? I have it right here. Yeah, it's, um, let's see. It's page 56. 56, here you go. Uh, okay, what is it? <laughs> it's halfway down. Neophobia a is oh, yeah. a, fear, a fear of new things. A fear of new things. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you can see it, neo and phobia. I mean, it kind of works together. Yeah, that's what I, I, hadn't, it was. I hadn't really thought about that. And, you know, there's, there's, I mean, I'm an old person. So, you know, there's a lot that I think about, about how we change as we age. My friend, Robert Dagoni, who you may not know him, he's another lawyer, writer, but he's a wonderful writer. And in his most recent book called The World and the World Play Chess, he points out that growing old is a privilege, not a right. It's a real privilege. And um, in thinking about that, I also thought how we adjust as we go along in when we're older, do we resist new things? Do, do you know, is part of our survival strategy, our way we manage um, to have routines? And, you know, as your short-term memory fades, do you always put your keys in one place? You know, do you, do you always do? And so do you begin to fear something new because um, you're going to have trouble dealing with it? Uh, you're not there yet because, uh, you know, I could be your mother, but uh, you do have to think no, about it. Not, no. Well, no, no, I think, no, I think it's true. Well, no, I am, I am a grandfather. So um, it's, no, that's, that's true. I, I don't, I, I mean, there are definitely changes I see in my life and even in my writing. I don't, there are things that were so important, important to me before that aren't important now and things that, you know, you know, books now are just, I don't know, I guess I, in some ways I appreciate it more that I get to do this. And um, I don't, I used to feel a lot of com competition with other writers, um, you know, especially like Nicholas Sparks. We share a lot of the same audience in the early days. Uh, I was sent the notebook before it was even published, you know, cause I was the big author and then he came out with the notebook and, and um, that doesn't matter anymore. I kind of find myself becoming more um, kind of isolated and that's okay. You know, I don't, I don't want the crowd so much anymore as I just want to hang out with people I love. And, and, uh, and that's probably a healthy thing and a good thing. I like spending more time with my wife now. Um, it's been nice not going on book tour because I. Well, you know, in a way, Richard, COVID has kind of been a preview of growing old because, you know, we, we have been, <laughs> well, it has been, we've been restricted, you know, right. in, you know, in our boundaries, because I remember thinking that about, about my parents, you know, that their world kept shrinking, you know, it was harder for them to go and do things. And so, you know, when you're young, you know, the world's an infinite place and you embrace new things and you fling it into it. But as you grow older, you know, you're less able to adapt and there are filters that go on and so forth. People are always asking me when I'm going to retire. And I say to them, you know, never, because what would I do? I mean, what would I do if I, you know, if well, exactly. I stopped? And, and I'm afraid that I would, my world would shrink to like my house, you know, and I'd never go out of it. And that's a horrible time. So, you know, what we did, my husband and I think we're really brave. We adopted two puppies in August that were three months old, litter mates. In fact, like your twins, we took, we took them both because I couldn't bear for one of them to be left behind. And I'm telling you that being a new mother, because really puppies are like babies, except they grow older faster, has been, it's exhausting, but it also has forced us to, you know, be more energetic to embrace new stuff. Cause you know, We've had to learn some things along the way. And I thought, in a way, it's really brave. But, but you'll love this. The woman who brought the puppies to us, the breeder, we, we had asked her if, we, if she'd bring up the, the little male puppy. And she was pretty shrewd. So she brought both of them because they were the last two of the litter. And of course, my husband took one look at the little black girl and he was completely lost. And I knew that you know we were going to end up um, with both of them. I could just see it happening. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and indeed, um, it's been a it's been a wild experience, but it's also been physically um, very good. I call it puppy Pilates because when you're constantly picking up puppies and doing all this stuff, you know, I, I um, feel better physically and better mentally because of this challenge. So I can recommend Sounds that. Very healthy for you. Yeah, no, it's, it's been absolutely <laughs> wonderful. So this book goes along and then uh, there's a, an epilogue, which I really like. Um, I like the pause, Richard, that, you know, you take the story to where it needs to go, but then there's, um, I like that step back. Um, you know, in a, in, a, in a mystery novel, you could go back to Nero Wolf and, you know, you would follow the investigation. And then there was always the moment when everybody gathered in Nero Wolf's, you know, the yellow room or whatever it was. And, you know, it was like a step back where then they would review the whole story and the whole investigation and tell you what happened. And it's an old fashioned way of writing a mystery novel, but it, but it worked. Um, and I think epilogues do a really good thing. In, in a story that, you know, you finish it and you go, and then there's a step back and you can see if you, if you, if the story demands it or if the writer wants to do it, you get an extra sort of an Easter egg. Um, you know, this is, this is where everybody is now that this time has passed. And I think in this story that worked particularly well. Yeah, I, um, I've done that in a, a few of my books and it, it's a device that I think does work well especially because they're dealing with so many, such an emotional um, piece as they come together. There's so many, there's so many things that are left unsaid. There's so many things that are undone that you're gonna have questions. There's just no way, and I can't go back and it would be wrong to try to go back and answer those questions in real time um, because you leave out this emotional peak, you know, of, them, of what happens with them and their relationship and and so to add on that, um, to come up with an epilogue and say, this is looking back. And it gives you a sense of I'm looking back on my life. And that's it, the book starts almost like that with a prologue saying, look, if I, I can look back now and see this story, but at the time I didn't know how it was gonna end. You know, and we can all see that in our lives. So, you know, with my first book, The Christmas Box, looking back, it's like, yeah, that was amazing. The odds of my first book breaking out and becoming this massive national bestseller were almost impossible. And um, I see it as part of my path now, but when I was going through it, it was pretty terrifying because um, my wife and I really risked a lot. And for a really big dream that wasn't very likely. And so looking back, I said, well, of course it was a good, it was a good move. It was a good smart thing to do. And but at the time it didn't make any sense at all. It was a very stupid move or so it would seem. I just felt very driven by, by fate. Like this is what I was supposed to do. Um, so I think, you know, in her case, she gets to step back. It's like, okay, here I am in this day. And, mm -hmm. and you know, some of my other series, I've done that as well. You know, the walk series starts out that way. And it, I think it has a sense of really, um, a real believability that this is a true story. And that's what we want to do in a, a novel. We want to dismiss reality and make this, and create this, or at least join a different reality. And the, the better we can do that, the more we can take someone to a story, the better. And so when people, um, you know, I actually, I, I got an email from a, a young woman yesterday from India and she's now 27. Uh, but she said, when I, was, when I was 16, I came across a book of yours. She's in a small town in India and uh, it was part of a Reader's Digest collection. And she said, the book changed my life. And after that book, I became a reader. And she said, I was being sexually abused at the time and no one would believe me. And the book was the book Grace. And she said, I, I don't know who this man is. I don't know where the story is, but this girl, she, he wrote my story about this girl that no one will believe. And um, so she wrote and said, after all these years, I didn't remember the story was called or your name. I just know it was the book that changed my life. She goes, I found it last week. And um, so she wrote my assistant said, just tell Mr. Evans how much it means. Well, I called her and got a chance to talk to her. And that was a little bit surreal for her, I think. But that's the beautiful thing about a book, whether I'm talking to, um, like I have, a, I have a huge fan club in, in Iran with my Michael Bay series. And uh, they've actually pirated the books because <laughs> we don't have any trade agreements. And so I've seen all these books in Farsi and it's like, when did we sell them to Iran? And my agent said, they don't, but you, but you have a huge following in Iran, but I'll never get a dime out of it. Uh, but the fact that they relate to the books as well, 
you know, this to me is the power of being a writer. And it's a really, it's a great gift and a great blessing. And you obviously love it. And I think that comes across so well when reading your books, you know, is how much you love the stories that you're telling and the way they're going to affect lives. And really, you know, since Rochelle, we know from the very beginning that she, that she's talking about story. I mean, I read, you know, that bit on page five where, you know, um, and so I, I like the, the fact that that there's a, a the story ends and then the story ends again um, seems to be to be a very um, very suitable for this book and this particular character. I mean, this is really a wonderful book, and you know, I, I I also go on about it because I think I think that that a really beautiful book, a really beautiful production, can also affect how you read it. It's such a pleasure to hold it, you know, to to look at the cover, to the interior design, and all makes the reading experience even lovelier um, than if it were unadorned. So let's call up Patrick um, and see if he has any comments to give us. And otherwise we may have stupefied your fans and we'll be done. <laughs> it's magic when he comes back. However, <laughs> where are you, Patrick? <laughs> You're not getting a coffee somewhere. <laughs> Love it. He must maybe got distracted by something. Oh, there he comes. No, I'm here. I just was had so many windows open that I couldn't find where I was. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, no, but uh, let's see here. Um, let's see here. Just a lot of people, Richard, uh, just weighing in about how much they love your work. Um, there is a question about, you know, film and TV adaptations. Anything in the works at the moment? Yeah. Um, the, my, the biggest thing right now, and Barbara, this is, we've, I think we've talked about this. I have my first feature film that's been produced. And um, it was produced by Netflix with um, fame director Charles Shire and uh, executive producer uh, Justin Hartley from This Is Us. He's the main actor. And that's the Noel Diary. And that's going to come out next year. So, um, and I'm very excited about that. The producer of that reached out. He read Christmas Promise twice. And he goes, the first time he read it, he called me, he goes, this is good. This is like, this will make a really great movie. And in his mind, it was controversial. I said, how is this controversial? He goes, it's just, it, I think it has some points that are just going to blow people away. And, and then he called me again. He goes, I just read the book again. I liked it even more the second time. And he goes, I want you to know, this is my big goal this year to get this produced as a movie. So um, we've had great interest. I've had eight of my books produced into, um, well, seven into TV movies and now, my first feature film and um, it's kind of exciting. So, and, and this set one has a good possibility, I think. That's wonderful. This is a reliable question. Um, so I, I don't ask it very often because it's always a question that fans ask. Another question that's and, come and in is- how much, oh, And then you asked how much control do I have? And it's really none. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the very first book they do, they, they get very upset if I don't like it, if I say anything. In fact, they write contracts. I can't say anything about the book um, negative um, or some have. Um, but um, like the, the one that was just produced, um, you want to have someone who respects the work. And what I understand the Noel Diary was, um, was that the, the director loved the book. He loved the story and it was very true to the story. And frankly, when you don't do that, when people are in love with the book and they go on to see it, it's you, you just hurt yourself because it's like, that's not what I wanted to see. Another question has come in that we get a lot, which is what do you like to read? What do you, what do you read for fun and pleasure? Um, I, okay, I don't read fiction, believe it or not. Um, I, I have trouble reading fiction. So I read nonfiction, um, the one, well, is. The one person, the closest thing I read to a novel is Eric Larson. I adore his books. Mm -hmm. I love, you know, Devil in the White City and Thunderstruck and um, his latest, The Splendid and the Vile. Um, but they're, they read like novels, right? But they're not. They're, they're nonfiction. So I read, I read a lot of biographies. Um, and, but I, I, have, I have real trouble um, reading fiction. It's just, it has to be super grippy. So there's a few authors I can I can read. I love John, you know, going back, I love John Steinbeck. If I would pattern myself after any writer, it'd be Steinbeck because um, and of course Tolkien and some of the fantasy I can get into. Let's see, anything else coming in here? 
In other words, I don't read what I write. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Sorry about that. Um, I mean, there's a question, where do you get so many great ideas? That's a tough yeah, one to yeah. answer, I'm sure. I've never written the book I thought it was. It's something you just throw yourself into. And do you remember the scene, if, if you watch the X-Men, when um, she's sitting next to Wolverine in a truck and the, you know, the claws come out and she goes, does it hurt? And he says, every time. And it's like, that's exactly, it's like every book is, you suffer over every book. It always hurts. Um, but that's the beauty of it. I, I think I'd be disappointed if it was easy. Nothing of, of great value in my life has ever been easy, especially parenthood and marriage. And the things, the things I treasure most are the things I have to fight for. So I think it's supposed to be that way. But the ideas, they just, sometimes they come easy. Sometimes you're just stretching. And uh, again, this book didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to. And they never do. I just, I get, I get in there and it's kind of like, I tell new writers, like, it's like walking into a Victorian mansion until you get inside and start going down the hallways. You don't know where anything leads. It's like, you can, you can outline all you want. And there are writers like Terry Brooks of Shannara. Terry like outlines like crazy. And James Patterson says he outlines like crazy. Um, I can't do that. So when I wrote the walk series, I just got in a car and drove from coast to coast over five years. And just is like, we'll figure this out as we go. And I experienced it just as the character did. And it made for an inc it made for one of my favorite pieces of writing. It sold more than a million copies in the walk. Do you write in longhand? So many writers seem to that we've been talking to lately. Yeah, I it's weird. It's part of my when I was diagnosed with Tourette syndrome, the um, psychiatrist asked me if I like to touch sharp objects. And um, I can show you, if, I, if you could see right here, there's two pencil sharpeners right here next to me. I have a drawer completely filled with pencils and I, I use the same pencil John Steinbeck did. Um, and it's like, if you have to ask why someone would pay $5 for a pencil, you don't, you won't understand anyway. So you don't even answer. Um, but I have to edit in pencils. I, I of course put it on the computer. Uh, we make the changes. And what I do, I print them off, go through in longhand, make the changes, give them to my assistant. She inputs them, which speeds things up. And then I go through and do the same process over and over, I keep adding. But there's something um, connected and grounded about using a pencil that I, I don't know how to explain it. it they have to be sharp. And so um, I'm, I'm sure I'm completely just kind of weird that way. I, I have them all lined up, you know, all these pencils next to me. And as soon as it starts to get dull, I toss it in the basket. Um, it's just what I have to do. But part of the Tourette syndrome is touching sharp objects. They bring me, it brings me peace to touch sharp things and touching something sharp to paper does the same thing for me psychologically. And I know that's totally bizarre, but it's true. There's you a know, lot of misunderstanding about, about Tourette's and what, and what exactly it is and how it manifests itself. Is that one of the ways? Yeah, I, yeah I, when he asked me if I touched sharp objects, I took seven sharp objects out of my pocket. And the, the biggest thing that if I can find it, the biggest thing I do is I take dollar bills, I fold them into sharp points. My wife, people know me, call them corners. And they can tell if I've been somewhere, if I leave a corner somewhere. I know someday I'll die and someone will find a corner somewhere and hopefully cry. <laughs> it's like, that's, <laughs> it, it um, in fact, one time for Christmas, Carrie gave me a stack of $1 bills that were crisp, they just off the press because the, the newer they are, the sharper the corners they make. So, but there's a lot of, um, like I got a, a letter from a woman yesterday saying my son's doing this. We think he might have Tourette syndrome. And um, usually what, the way we identify, I said it does, from what she wrote, it sounded like she had Tourette's and parents bring their kids with Tourette's to see me. Uh, especially my character, Michael Bay has Tourette's syndrome. Um, the, the thing we normally see are the, um, are the, uh, the verbal tics. And I had horrible verbal tics. It's very painful when I was young. And I'm not gonna do it because I'll start doing it and I won't both stop tonight. Um, but I used to make this gulping sound like my Michael Bay character does. So that's the other weird thing. I was at a, a book signing the other night and we had this big event and two of the authors had Tourette's and that's why they had come connected. And within minutes, I was just twitching like crazy. And it's like, I can't go to conferences or events and because I immediately just start picking up on the, uh, on the ticks and they hurt. Mm. You know, I tell kids, if you want to know what Tourette's like, I said, just start blinking. Um, I haven't blinked for 30 seconds. 
And by at the end of 30 seconds, they're screaming, they're shouting. I tell the teachers not to get mad. I go, just let it happen. I've done it a hundred times. So I know what Jack is going to happen. And then I say, okay, how do you feel? It's like, it hurts. I go, now do it for the next 18 hours. Okay. No way. And it's like, I remember just sitting there holding my eye like this, like just trying to stop. It's like, I can't stop moving it. It's just trying to stop it and just hoping the pain would go away. Speaking of Michael Vick. sympathetic nervous system that gets out of whack and you can't, yeah. you can't control it. It's like people get uncontrollable hiccups. You know, there's, it's, it's your sympathetic nerve system. You, it's hard to calm it down. Yeah, just it really is. And you can delay it. People say, well, can you just pretend like you're not? It's like, well, it's like an itch. I can not scratch myself for a while. Or someone says, don't do that. And like when I first started to manifest, my first twitch was this. It was like my shoulders. I was eight years old. And I remember I couldn't stop doing this. It was a shrug. And my mom said, stop. And then she, it was horrible. She meant well. I mean, you know, as parents, we all have moments we're not proud of. She pointed at, we were at church, she pointed to a man who had a hunchback. This old, you know, feeble man with a hunchback. She goes, "You're going to look like that if you don't stop." It's like, great. I mean, an eight-year-old hunchback, you know. And it's just, and so what I do when she was around, I would stop. But then as soon as she was gone, I would just do it. And it's just the way it is. You cannot, you cannot scratch your itch, but the itch doesn't go away. You have to wait till you can get to it, right? I was just going to ask one last question about you mentioned Michael Vay. Any plans to bring him back? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Um, I mean, Michael Bay sold, but the book came out in 2011. It sold 2,000 copies last week. Last week. We're up to three and a half million copies and it's growing around the world. And I get so much mail on Michael Bay. So much mail. And um, if I told Simon Schuster, um, they've been reaching, it's like, frankly, I miss the kids. I had, if you imagine this, Barbara, I had 4,000 kids come to one of my book signings for Michael Bay. 4,000 children. Remember, they were that. cultural events. Yeah, so I'm, so I'm, uh, yeah, I've started writing Michael Bay again, and we're looking, we just signed a contract with Simon Schuster for three more books, and um, it's fun to get back into it. Michael's fun to write about. He's, he's a fun kid. Uh, well, there are a few that have just come in, and then maybe we should uh, wrap it up. Uh, Judy asks, what are you working on now? Um, and then Barbara asks, do you have a hard time leaving your characters behind when you finish a book? Um, I'm working on Michael Bay 8 right now. Um, I just finished a book of my essays. It's called How I Saved My Marriage. Um, stories about marriage, family, and other supernatural feats. And um, that was, that was planned to come out next year, but it's gonna come out a year from now. My most read thing is my blog. My, How I Said My Marriage blog had more than 120 million reads. 120 million, it went completely viral. And my wife hated every one of them. It's like, <laughs> you asked me to try to take it down. It's like, you can't take it down, but it's the genie's out of the bottle. Um, and do I ever have trouble leaving characters behind? Not as much as you might think. Uh, my, with Michael Bay, I have, because that was a, that was a um, seven year run and became so much a part of my character and the kids, kids were calling me Michael. They think my name is Michael Bay. And it kind of became part of this persona. And so um, maybe that's why I'm going back to it. In a series like this, um, not so much, but I understand, you know, I was a Walking Dead fan. And um, I remember I, when they killed Glenn, it's like, I was so upset. I was so upset I stopped watching. So did half the, half the viewers that night. It was just so disturbing. And, um, you know, you get connected to these characters and, and uh, I understand that. And that, I think that's a good a sign of a good book or a good movie. It's like when you feel like you know the characters, then you've, you've, you've done what you wanted to do. You, they, they became part of the family. And people will write me and say, I feel like they're family. I want to invite them over for dinner. And people with the walk series hear about this guy walking across the country. People would ask me all the time, where is he? Can I meet him? Can, can we have him over for dinner? It's like, he's not a real person. And they just didn't want to believe it. And sometimes they wouldn't believe it. Yes, he is real. One woman just said to me, she goes, I she was angry. I said, he's not real. He's not a real person. She goes, maybe not to you, Mr. Evans, but he is to me. And I thought that's really profound. And it, make, it, it it's pleasing to me when people read it and say, I know that person. They're real. Because then, then, you've, then you've sold the story, okay? then you sold the story and that, and then it becomes part of their lives. And that's really, that's my ultimate goal. 
just have something that becomes part of them. Well, Richard, it's been an absolute delight as ever to speak with you. Um, this is the book, in fact, in which these characters' stories are brought to a, a wonderful place. And I can see that you could leave them to be happy in the lives that you have given them. Um, and, you know, that's a wonderful thing. So we do have autographed copies of The Poison Pen, which Richard was kind enough to sign for us. And the book does go on sale next Tuesday. If you order it, we could probably start shipping it to you at the end of this week, but we have to be careful because we get our knuckles wrapped by publishers if we sneak one out ahead of time. So we can't do that. In any case, um, let me wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving and a happy holiday season. And Richard, the same to you. And um, Thank you. I certainly hope we'll get to talk again before the next holiday season or during the next holiday 